Arteta. What a banned from the Champions League for two years. Can we just pretend that's what happened to us, too? This is the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. My name is Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. That's right, Manchester City banned from the Champions League, and I am sure that in no way will the Court for Arbitration of Sport have any means to undo this. Will their money in any way uh, secure them a favorable outcome from this in the end? I am sure they will continue to have that two-year ban and uh, and will serve it and will pay the fines, and justice will absolutely be served. I have no doubt whatsoever. Uh, hello, everybody. Hope you enjoyed your winter break. Lots of fun pictures of people getting tan in Dubai, but it is back to football now, and that means we're going to get serious. No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to get serious. We're going to do a Would You Rather pod. If you missed it last time, probably about a year or so ago we did this. It was a lot of fun, and at a time when it's I wouldn't say no news, but slow news and, and no football specifically to discuss. This can be a fun way to address some of the issues around the club, uh, and we will certainly touch on the Champions League one as well. So here to do that with us is Scott. You can find him at O underscore that underscore crab. Welcome to the main pod, Scott. Yeehaw, it's good to be here. Yeah, Scott on the main stage, Scott. Uh, Paul's on Twitter at Pause My Pants. Hello, Paws. Woohoo. Woohoo, indeed. Clive's on Twitter at Clive PAFC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. And Tim is here. You can find him on Twitter at Stoberto. Hello, Tim. Hello there. This is what they call the full boat. The Gang Does a Would You Rather Pod is the title of this Always Sunny in Philadelphia episode. And so, I will start with you, Tim. Would okay. you rather Manchester City's ban from the Champions League result in fifth place getting Champions League or no additional Champions League place granted? Now, just to clarify, the reason I'm asking it that way is the team that looks most likely yeah. to benefit would be Spurs. Yeah, and it also means that eighth place could go into the Europa League um, qualifying rounds and we could finish in eighth. But I would still prefer for it to um, yeah, for it to open up fifth place because I think we've got an outside chance there and it just I think Arsenal are doing well enough at the moment, <clears throat> tangentially, that if they have something to chase after um, that they might go quite well and they might get on a bit of a run. Um, so, yeah, I'd I'd go for that. I, I say go for it. Why not? Um, I, I think Spurs would have a shot at fourth anyway, mm. to be quite frank, because I don't think Chelsea are all that. So, uh, yeah, let's let's have it. Let's go for fifth. The, the only way I'd regret that is, like I said, if Arsenal finished eighth and we were in the Europa League uh, qualifying rounds, I, I think that would suck. But there you go. Those are the odds. I'll play them. I think whatever outcome results in us having to play competitive football in July is probably what's going to happen. Um, <laughs> and, and that's, by the way, that can happen. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, Paul, how about you? Would you rather Arsenal, and, and in both of these scenarios, we don't win the Europa League. Okay, so ignore the Europa League, all right? Mm -hmm. Would you rather Arsenal win the FA Cup but finish outside the European places or fail to win the FA Cup, but qualify for the Europa League? Win the FA Cup. Um, and my, uh, I mean, winning the FA Cup would be, uh, could be the, a thing that sets us, we've, ha we've had this conversation before, but it does set um, Arteta and this, this squad up for uh, building belief, etc. And it gets, it unites the fans, etc. And I, I think that's all been true. It's been in, true in the past. It just hasn't been enough. Um, whereas, you know, just getting into the Europa League and having another slog through, um, I'd almost prefer that, uh, as somebody wrote during the week, that Arteta had the, the squad, the team to himself during the week so that he can really build something next year. And that's a risk. It, it, that argument goes back and forth, but that's a risk I'd take next year. And not, not super excited about the Europa League. It hasn't given us a platform to push on so far. So I'd be okay with that if we won FA Cup, had all of that fun, um, ha had a hell of a day, built some momentum, and had our free time to ourselves next year to practice synchronicities and automatisms. I guess theoretically, you can also 
wouldn't wouldn't we get the Europa League by winning the FA Cup? So I think I've undermined my whole question. Yeah. So so you know yeah, what? Yeah, I was I was I meant to ask you that at the start. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to disqualify that. My point was lose essentially both, to say yes, get yeah. knocked out of the Europa League, lose the FA Cup in the final mm-hmm. in devastating but exciting fashion that really brings everybody together, but doesn't force us into Europe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because I look. You can make an argument that winning the FA Cup at the expense of the Europa League is short-term thinking in a scenario where the FA Cup doesn't get you the Europa League, which it does, so this is moot, so I'm moving on because I've embarrassed myself. As (laughs) usual, Clive, would you rather, for every single game the rest of this season, we play a front line of Saka, Aubameyang, and Nelson, or Martinelli, Lacazette, and Pepe? Um, ha, I gotcha. <laughs> um, the first one. Say again, because I lost you. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Oh, my, my bad. It was Saka, Aubameyang, and Nelson, or Martinelli, Lacazette, and Pepe. Yeah, I. Uh, I'd go with the first one. I would go. Um, I, I like Saka, and I like I like Aubameyang. And um, the options on the right hand side, no one's in great shape at the moment, but those two are. So I'll go Saka Aubameyang, that option. Yeah, I mean, on the strength of Aubameyang's goals alone, I mean, do, do you think if I had asked you this maybe like five months ago when you know Lacazette hadn't sort of bottomed out, do you think your answer might have been different? Lacazette's been worrying me from since preseason, and I. I always feel sometimes, we used to do this really well when we were a different club. I always felt Wenger sold players one year too early. But in hindsight, he sold them a lot of them at the right time. Um, I think he got he changed towards the end when he, did, when he liked people too much and he kept them around too long and paid them too much. But I think, you know, we're in a different place, right? And we just missed out in the Champions League by a point and got to the final, blah, blah, blah. He was our player of the season. I'm not sure what the offers were, but you have to look at some people, look at their body types and body shapes and where they are from their monetary return and where they're going to be from a, a playing for us going forward and how much they're going to give us in, the, in an English league. And I would have sold him in the summer. Not mm. because I don't like him. I like him. But this is business. I would have sold him. I would have got a different type of forward that allowed us to do more things in the box, particularly in the air, because we lack that at the moment. So when teams go into low blocks, I don't think we've got anything to anything to to attack them with. And you only got to look at what happened in the Europa League final. That told you something. That told you people gave us the outsides, said, we, you're not going to have to box. What are you going to do? We had nothing. So that, for me, was a strategic move we should have made, but there's no one thinking strategy. At yeah. that time, but hopefully they are now. So yeah, I I go like as out of my lineup. So, okay, I I I would probably go with that just on the strength of Obama Yang's goals, and I mean, I think. Saka can do things on the wing that maybe Martinelli can't, despite, I think, Martinelli being the more pure goal scorer, but you've got Aubameyang in there. I think Nelson is more functional than Pepe, but that could work. Uh, yeah, I just think Lacazette's form is too low to pick him. Okay, Scott, uh, you're our analytics guy. You're our data guy. So this is going to be a really tough question for you. Are you prepared for it? No. Okay. You didn't give me any for a warning. All right. Would you rather finish 10th but be the best team in the league on XG or win the league? I mean, I'd rather win the league. Okay. It was a tough one. I was a trick question. Just wanted it to was. Okay. Let's yeah. give you a real and, one. You know, I, I Good answer. I was trying hard to, to not be technical on some of the early questions <laughs> okay. because I wanted to be able to be involved in the pod. Yeah. Because, you know, really thinking about it with the Manchester City ban, you know, it could be still the top four if Manchester City falls outside of it after, you know, all of their players leave for not being able to be in the Champions League. Mm. You know, yeah. that's a technical thing that we could think about. I somehow think that they'll be able to pay enough money to keep them, but, <laughs> you know, we'll figure it out. All right, so let's do a transfer market one. Would you rather sell Aubameyang this summer if all you could get for him is $40 million, or sign him to a three-year deal on one hundred and eighty grand a week? Those are your only two options. I would sign him for three years at one hundred and eighty. That seems to be a bargain. You're going to lose him for free, though, right? And you're then going to have to solve the center forward problem with, you know, no resources. But you do have three years into his, one would assume, declining period, right? Yeah, and I think that's still a fairly reasonable wage for his skill. I don't imagine him to to have a massive fall off. Um, 
and I don't think forty million really gets you a ton um, in the market to replace him. So I think I would rather have the player at a reasonable wage over not having the player and not really having enough money to replace him. Okay. Um, yeah. I, look, you you don't have to convince me to keep Aubameyang. <laughs> okay. You, you you talk me into it. Uh, Tim. Uh, I, yeah. I mean, I think you know yeah. the price is you know plus you know sixty maybe. Then you start thinking about that. You know, that's that's probably where the cost benefit kind of you know tilts more towards selling. Mm. Um, especially about you know you talked about that the, that deal. Uh, 180 seems perfectly reasonable for a very good player. Um, you know, it's not like he's going to be at like 250 or 300 thousand because then that might be too much. Where it's a you know uh, an actual anchor on the team. So what I think what that's, wage uh, would he have? Stuff. What wage would he have to be on where you'd switch and choose the 40? Uh, I mean, I'd have to kind of really think about it, but I, I think you'd have to be looking at you know 250 plus a week. Okay. That's probably too much. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. I mean, look, I think sell them all and give all the money to Martinelli, but, you know, whatever. Um, all right, so, uh, Tim, mm. would you rather next season finish 10th, one place above Spurs, or second, one place behind Spurs? Oh, 10th, one place above Spurs. Definitely. <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, God, no. Lose it. Not only Spurs winning the league, but but... Be, like us being presumably in the title race with them and losing it to them. I've got like. Well, I right, what if I said we finish like 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 Liverpool this season? They just ran away with it. Even worse, potentially. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like in any scenario where Spurs win the league, I'm I'm not choosing that. And I don't I don't I don't care about the logical arguments. Like we went through this with the whole "Would you win the Europa League if it meant Spurs winning the Champions League?" No, fuck that was that. easy. Yeah, that was an easy no for you. Absolutely not. No, I'm not having Spurs winning the league. I know that's cowardly. I know that's, you know, not in Arsenal's interests and all of that. But no, fuck that. I'm not having that. I'm not having Tottenham winning the league in any version of reality or any hypothetical universe. Not happening. Okay, I'll I'll give you one more then. Another really substantive one here. Actually, let me give you a substantive one. You deserve that. Um, If you could choose between one of these two young players hitting the sort of ceiling of of what you think you could get from them reasonably. Would you choose Martinelli or Saliba? Oh, really good question. I will say Saliba just because I I kind of trust Arsenal more to find attackers than I do defenders, basically. Um, you know, if, if Saliba could hit like a real... If you look at like what... Van Dyke's done at Liverpool and what Sol Campbell did for us and you know how Harry like Spurs have had that old Harry Kane thing because they just happen to have like a world-class striker fall out of their academy I mean Arsenal had that for 20 years with Tony Adams they just happen to have um, the best English centre-back of his generation completely free of charge and they kept him for his whole career um, and you know if if Saliba could hit that kind of that kind of ceiling, you know, I, I'm I'm kind of happy enough that Arsenal could get some good attackers. I don't see us getting like a generational defender anytime soon. And when I look at some of the defenders we're buying at the moment, they're kind of they're all in the good but not great category potentially. Um, yeah, I'd go with Saliba because I think that would sort us out. For 10 years or so, uh, maybe more. Martinelli, if he hits the kind of ceiling that we think he could hit, he'll probably go to Real Madrid or Barcelona Mm, in a few years anyway. Whereas I think maybe we've got a slightly better chance of holding on to a centre half for a bit longer. Mm, Yeah, I mean, it's tough, right? Because if I think we all have in the heads that Martinelli's ceiling is like Cunaguero, that it's that it's best player in Premier League, maybe one of the best strikers the Premier League has seen. And I realize that's fanciful, but that's that's the scenario I set up. I don't know that you can decide not to take that because I still think, and this just shows my bias, Tim, I still think that defense can be solved with system, but goals can't, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. So, but, but I do see your point. I mean, if you get a Virgil van Dijk from Saliba, that's a game changer. It really is, and it lets you build a system that is more attacking because you don't have to protect a weak backline like Arteta's doing now. So I see your point. Um, all right, Paul, this is a tricky one, okay? And mm-hmm. it, it requires you to think in a self-interested way, but you know, I feel comfortable that you can do that. Would you rather have Unai Emery back as coach for another three years 
or have diarrhea for six months? Um, you die from diarrhea for six no, months. No, no, no. You could live through it. You could live through I it. Lived, I lived through it. Whereas I'm not sure I could live yeah, I'm through I'm not sure you lived years. through the Emory. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but it is an excuse to go on a rant about that, Unai. Would he just maybe, shut maybe up? Maybe the thing is you have to live through three years of Unai Emory. You don't, have <laughs> you a don't get a choice. No, se- no seppuku. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's an easy one. Jesus, he's done himself no favors this week, has he? You're taking the diarrhea? Yeah, oh yeah. By the way, can that be the quote, like, that when, when people say, what's the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast about? Just be like, they're taking the diarrhea. That can be, that can be our quote. Um, okay, well, now i got a serious one for you. Would you rather keep Pepe through the remainder of his contract mm-hmm. and lose him for free or sell him this summer for 30 million pounds? Uh, 30 million. Well, again, 30 million doesn't necessarily buy you a whole lot of whatever. Um, Say 40 million. Say 40 million. mm, Okay, getting interesting. I think I still lean to 40 million, still not a... I'm a really good negotiator. Still not a game changer. (laughs) Um, But if you could get me up to about 72 million plus bonuses, (laughs) taking me to 80 million... Answer the question as it was asked, please. (laughs) Plus a fat fee for his agent, and I was that agent, then then we might be talking. Um, I think you hold on to him. I think I roll the dice. I still think there's a hell of a lot more to get from him. Um, <clears throat> I think he came in after Arteta, so if the money was enough, it was if it was 45 going on to 50 million, maybe you hit the reset button and say, Arteta, he, here's 50 million. Who's the player you want playing from the right? But I still think Pepe can be a a top player for us. Um, not entirely sure where his head's at. He just has that kind of funky look about him when he's wandering around the pitch. Um, I don't know how really tuned in he is and ever will be. Um, but my tendency would be to see if we've still got a, a near world ca- class player there and you don't get that for 40, 45 million most of the time. Mm. Yeah. I, mean, I, I-, I know I lose him for, for zero at the end of it, but if we got him on what five years or something like that, then that gives us an exciting four years ahead. If he's the business. Yeah. I mean, it's a gamble on his quality, right? If you think he's a yeah. bust, if you're of that mindset, then you just mm-hmm. sell him and move on because keeping him to the end of his contract also means you got to try to integrate him. You got to try to use him. Right. So that's the opportunity cost. If you think he's a bust, I don't, I'd keep him. Cause I, I still think there's a superstar in there, but it is tricky, right? Cause keeping him means giving Nelson less playing time or not going out and getting another right winger. And if you think he's not going to make it, these are the decisions you have to make early, not late, as we saw with our erstwhile manager. Um, yeah, and I, I think the only other quick factor is whether he's a fit for how Arteta wants to play. Does does Arteta want outside wingers, or do you want does he want inverted wingers? Yeah, and does Pepe is Pepe good at at adapting to different schemes? And we don't really know that yet. Only the manager yep. would know that. But that could be another reason to pull the plug. Yeah, agreed. Um, okay, Clive. This Go. one's near and dear to your heart. Would you rather this summer sell Saka for forty million or Gwen for fifty million? Uh, Gwen Doozy for fifty million. Here, I here. think I think I like him. He's a good player, but I think um I think that player can be found quite easily. And I still worry about a lack of speed. Give me a a chunky speedster. That's got a heart that shoots, that tackles, that works, that crosses like a dream. Um, give me Saka all day long. And by the way, <laughs> I say that as he could be about to be sold. <laughs> I say that thinking, we sometimes we have to remember, um, I didn't really realise this when we talk about these young players, but a lot of them are born, you know, born in London, local local lads. Right? And I think those ones are... Easier to hold on to? Really no, they're really precious. They're really precious because they mean something to people that go to the games. You know, I know, I know it's not about everyone that goes to the games. It's not about just them, but it is nice when you see somebody that lives not too far away from you. That's um, you know on the on the pitch, right? So I think it's good. So yeah, that's a that's a big thing, and it's a big thing for the academy as well because it it sets an example. Say, look, this is what you can do. 
and it's good for the whole club top to bottom. So, yep, I keep Saka all day long. Yeah. Okay. I, I, let me ask you a question. What if it's the same money, whatever that money is? Still keeping Saka over Gwen for the same money? Yeah, absolutely. I, I like Gwen Doozy, but, you know, some of the players that we're, what we're asking him to do is um, it's different. I mean, maybe in a different system we could see a different player. I think if he was, you know, one up in a two in a two layered midfield, but that that layer isn't there at the moment. He's one of he's behind the ball, and um, if we do go to the V, it's a slightly different scenario. We have one 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 in and two ahead, and you have you got a nice little armchair for the midfield, and they they've got a lot of responsibility to drive and lead and and show personality. Then you think, okay, you're a different asset in this role. I think he's uh, he's as bravery, receiving the ball when between centre halves and helping build play, and showing a little bit of um, you know Robbie Savage type anger to get people wound up, etc. But um, but yeah, to me that's that's replaceable. Whereas I I just favour um, Saka. But you know me, you guys know me. I always favour speed, you know, drive, penetration, devastation. I like that. that uh, hey, I favor penetration like. too, man. It's it's no big deal. Look, um, I will say, <laughs> yeah, you know, it we, took we, me a while to, it took me a while to like Seth Fabregas, I tell you now, it took me a long time to like him. That's the and worst thing you've type. ever said on this podcast. <laughs> no, you, you gotta be honest and true, right? You gotta yeah. be honest and true. It took me a while to like him because I, I thought he was a bit metronomic, you know, Kimmy Vieira all day long, but then you see a different side of him as, as he developed behind the ball into a ten. Then you see that football's also about what sort of personality you bring and how you influence a game. I thought his influence was huge. So he's different players, different people have different preferences, right? Um I got one one more for you, super quick, Clive. Would you rather be on every single Arsenal Vision post match podcast episode or on the Arse cast once every six weeks? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, in case you missed it, Clive, Clive it. was on the Ars cast this week and quite excellent, I must say. Yeah. I enjoy I enjoy talking to Andrew. It's very, very easy. But but um but our submission is my home. Okay. Okay, thank you. I, I I assume that talking to me just as easy. Just as easy, just as enjoyable. Uh, I'm not just. gonna let you answer that. Uh, I believe I'm on the Scott, is that right? Yeah, because I'm not used to wrangling this many people. Order, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, Scott. Next season, if I told you one of these two things, you wouldn't know anything about the other. If I told you we w- would score 100 goals or concede 20, which would you, ch- would you rather score 100 goals or concede 20? You know what? I just, just looked up kind of the, the stats on this, and uh, conceding less has a, a higher impact on you know, points you know, actually accumulated. So I think... I'm going to take the 20 goals um, conceded. Which do you think would be the more enjoyable season to watch? Um, I mean, I think the most enjoyable season is the one where the team wins. What if in that 20-goal season we scored 50? Plus 30 goal difference? I mean, that's, that's, that's much better than what we've been the last, you know, well, what, 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 do we, what do we concede on average in a season? 50 goals? 45 goals? Or the last couple of seasons, 45 goals, something like that? Um, I think, yeah, about a, a goal and a half or so. So, yeah, I think mean, we're yeah, about, about 50. So, if you scored, so, I mean, if you scored yeah, 100, you're looking at a plus 50 goal difference. difference. So, yeah, that's fair. Um, can, okay. I, uh, can I yeah. point to the case of 1998-99 here? Mm-hmm. Please do. Um, where Arsenal conceded 19 goals, I think. Um, and Manchester United conceded 39 so they conceded 20 more goals than Arsenal, but they scored 21 more goals than Arsenal and won the league by one point. Mm. Scott. So they had a one better goal difference and one more point. And that the summer before, Arsenal um, were about to sign Patrick Cliver and didn't because uh, they balked at the wages. And then they proceeded to lose the league by one point because... Manchester United scored 21 more goals than Arsenal. Scott, did did Tim just, I I don't know if this is what the kids call, but did he just dunk on you? Is that what just happened there? (laughs) I don't, I don't know. Just it's just from a a one season example. It's a one (laughs) season example. I mean, I think if you look, you know, historically, <laughs> here we go. Seating less would be great. <laughs> yeah, but but I mean, is that what you would choose? I mean, based on what you've looked at, I know you did look at the data, which is why I kind of leaned into giving you this one. That is the one that traditionally would be more of a, a predictor of of finishing higher up the table, right? 
Well, so it depends on where you start. At. So when you're down at the, the lower you know, part of the table, scoring is more important, um, you know, because you can turn um, draws into wins and you can turn losses into draws. Um, when you are at the top of the table, um, you will have a better chance of, you know, when you give up less goals, you turn more draws into wins. So that is kind of the idea. So you're already scoring goals. So if you stop the other team from scoring, you will continue to score goals is the idea, as long as you know you don't make too big of a trade-off. Um, so that's kind of the idea. So I, I, I love, you know, free-flowing football, and that's why I liked Arsenal. So I, it, it really pains me to say I, I don't want to go see 100 goals because that would be so exciting. But, you know, if that goes with conceding 70 at the same time, I don't know if I would take that. It, it would be interesting, right? I mean, if you finish with a plus 30 goal difference, 100 scored, 70 conceded, where do you think you'd finish in the table? I mean, you'd still probably be, you know, pretty high up there. Um, you know, you, you did score 100 goals, so I guess it just depends on the sequencing of things. See, it's tough, right? Because I can't carve a scenario in my mind where we score 100 and the season isn't a ton of fun. I can, in my doomy misery carve out a season where we sco- concede 20 and still don't enjoy watching us play. So I, I don't know, maybe that's just how I'm wired. But I get your point statistically that one one is a greater predictor than the other. Uh, Tim, I'm going to ask you one that probably has been asked before, and then I'll, I'll give you another one after it. But I'm so hung up on this mm-hmm. point that I'm just going to continue to beat away at it for years and years to come. <clears throat> Would you rather we did everything the way we did or... We never signed Ozil and instead re-signed Sesk the following summer when he was available. Yeah, we've done this one before. I was so, hang on, this was 2013, right? Um, when we signed Ozil. Yeah, was so it you're one saying, summer later or two summers later that he went to Chelsea? Sesk went to Chelsea. It was one summer yeah. later. So the so season we got Ozil, we'd have no one. We'd have you know, had to make yeah. do and then we would have gotten Sesk the next summer. I, I still would have gone with the Ozil signing because I think we really needed that at the time. And I think in 2014, we had Cazorla, we had Wilshire fit at the time at that summer. We had Ramsey and we had Ozil. Um, and if you remember, we were pl- we were like playing Wilshire on the left wing and sometimes Ozil on the left wing because we had too many players in that position. And I, I'm not sure adding Fabregas to it would have been... Would have been great for us tactically. I, I also think, you know, Fabregas is just a guy you've got to build the team around. Um, and that means you've got to put a couple of destroyers either side in, in midfield. I, I think if you, and you could look, you could argue that this is worth it. But I think if you buy Fabregas in 2014, you probably have to get rid of Cazorla. Um, you definitely have to get rid of Wilshire, which, you know, in hindsight would have been the right thing to do. And you probably have to buy a, like a, at least one really good kind of defensive midfielder um, as well, which again you could you could argue would have been beneficial anyway. I, I think it would have been a lot more work. Um, so I yeah I think I'd have gone with the Özil signing just because we got we got a couple of FA Cups off the back of it, um, and actually we were in the top four fairly comfortably in those seasons. I think uh, that fell apart for other reasons in subsequent years, not really connected to Ozil um, or a lack of Fabregas. Mm. A good and interesting answer, as I would expect from you. Now we'll see what Paul has. Uh, Paul, would Mm -hmm. you rather Eduardo never got injured or Diaby never got injured? Uh... Well, Eduardo was at a critical time for us. Uh, it, it, Diaby, I loved uh, as a, a player and what he could have been for us and what he was at times. But uh, Eduardo, I mean, that that uh, tore a hole in that uh, 07, 08 season, wasn't it? And we were, we were humming, we were rocking, everything was going. Um, and we looked like we were well on track to, uh, to win. Uh, the league that season and what would that have meant going forward and what would that have meant for Arsene Wenger and his his ambition uh, to keep that going in future years so I think it would Eduardo would have been a game changer beyond himself as a player within the club uh, beyond that season and the history of the club and and Arsene Wenger's history with us he might have gone away from a uh, 
making do with what he has, managing a good club and maintained his ambitions to be uh, to, to go neck and neck and get ahead of Sir Alex Ferguson from there on in. Mm. You know, it's tough, right? Because if Diaby never got hurt, there is the potential that he becomes sort of a unicorn type player, right? One that could lift the club to... And a lot of that speculation. I don't think Diaby, as Tim has pointed out many times, was ever quite as good as we like to remember him in his at his best moments. So it's questionable what he would have become. But to your point, like if Eduardo never gets injured, I really do think we win a title in 0708, and that team deserved it, and the whole trajectory of the club I think changes there. So, yeah, fair question, and and one that you have answered well. So I agree with you. Um, and not, not to mention that we would have had uh, he was a special player. I mean, his career was lost yeah. just just as much as Diaby's was. It's just he wasn't yeah. with the club, so we didn't notice it as much. Um, you know, another yeah. injury, by the way, that during that period that I, I think is underrated is Rosicki. Rosicki arrived to us at a moment where his stock was super high. He had just had a really eye-catching World Cup. He was a good player. He missed, what, 18 months with muscular injuries? Something like that. So he's another player that I know divides opinion, but had he not had those injury problems, I sort of wonder what would have happened to him. A lot of what-ifs with injuries for us, whether it's Wilshire, Cazorla, Rosicki, Diaby, Eduardo, just way too many. Ramsey, I guess, at some level. All right, Clive, would you rather finish top four this season and win no silverware, so fourth, or win the Europa League and the FA Cup? Now, you know what? That's, that's too loaded, just the Europa League. Would you rather finish fourth or win the Europa League? I go for win the Europa League um, because we get the same outcome and I get a massive drink on the back of winning a cup final in Europe. Oh, you're right? going to so, get a massive drink regardless. Come on, man. What are we talking about here? <laughs> I'm currently drinking, but, so cheers to that. <laughs> what's that? What's that? My, right? So like, the thing is, you know, I always say this and you almost know I'm going to say our record in Europe for the club that we are is absolutely disgraceful. It really is. We just haven't done anything. And um, and so anything we can do in Europe, I take that all day long. You know, just you know, I just I did happen to be in the ground when we won our last European trophy, and um, I never thought then that that would be the last European trophy that we won. You know, so um, it's just it's just ridiculous what we've what we what we've done. So I think I take that all day long. If you want to, you know, if you want to grow the club, you know, we have to go into Europe. I'm afraid and do something and. Mm. And not just be there for monetary reasons to help pay off a, a stadium debt because our interest rates are too high. That's what it felt like. You know, we just had to be there for many of the the great achievements that Wenger got us into that for sort of 16, 17 years on the trot. I think it just felt like it, it was a necessity financially. I don't think we quite looked at the sporting achievement hard enough. I well, know I didn't. I took it for granted. And now we're out of it. Um, I think quite that was a massive sporting achievement, and, and I think financial achievement took over my sort of mindset and, and many others, I presume. So I think anything to get back into that competition and respect it properly, I think, is what we need to do as an ambition for the club. I think a sustainable Champions League club, rather than one that just creaks in for four or five years and then tries to creak, creep in the next day. You know, the next year, sorry. I think that's what we were. We were always looking at fourth. We used to be first or second, then it went third or fourth. And eventually the gamble didn't pay off. So I'd love to get back to the stage where we're in, then we stay in in a sustainable way. Mm, Yeah, you know the one thing I would say, Clive? This seems like a very easy question. But to finish fourth this season, we probably have to be on a 90-point pace. 90, 9-0 the rest of the season. That is such an electrifying pace. Were we to do that, what it would say about Arteta and the development under Arteta and what we could achieve next season, I think would arguably be more impactful, if you follow me. Like, if we go on a 90-point pace run the rest of the season, you're going to say, holy shit, Arteta solved this. We're good. We're a good team. If we kind of peter out in the league and manage to win the Europa League, yes, we'd raise a trophy, and I'm not diminishing the importance of that, and yes, we'd still be in the Champions League, but is it possible that we come away from the season not as convinced as if we went on a 90-point pace run the rest of the season? Does that make sense, that that kind of analysis it, it of it? It's a it's great analysis, and I think you know, I, these really are the questions that I find quite painful. 
But this one really isn't a painful question because the way you set that scenario up, it, I, I would could easily do that as well. Do you mm. know what I mean? It's yeah. like it's not really a painful choice because the outcome is what we're really all about. Really, and I think how you get there is is in, is important. But the outcome for me in this case is slightly more important. But I take your point. It's well, well said. Well, well you're choosing between two types of success. So the question is, you know, would you choose the success that fills up the trophy cabinet, or would you choose the success that may have more implications long term for the trajectory of the club? That's a really tricky question, uh, which is why we are is. doing this. <laughs> Can I give you another scenario? Yeah, Can please. I give you another yeah. scenario that um, <laughs> that uh, we go to Europa League final and. Um, um, and we play in Manchester United in the Europa League final and beat them like three two something like that. That mm. that would be that would be something I wouldn't forget. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't I would forget. I would say ten nil, but you know that's fine. I've I've heard it both ways. Uh, all right, Scott, how about a little fantasy land? You ready for fantasy land? These are all fantasy land. But would you rather add? And because I'm me, I did go back and, and run the numbers for the last question. Oh, yeah, so please, I, yeah. I have the yeah. Tell so me. I plugged it, plugged it into the calculator here. Um, so you could just say your goals, brain. We, you could just say your brain. You don't have to call it a calculator. Scoring 100 goals would be a ton of fun, but that's about a 67-point season, according to the model. Um, oh. Conceding 20 um, is about a 77-point season. So both of those, because we only have a 30-goal you know, differential, um, it probably doesn't lead to a title. Um, teams that usually have about 30 um, usually come in about um, between third and fourth. It was 3.7 was the average. Um, but then I did go look at this over the last 20 years, teams that have conceded less than 25 goals. Um, there's only been a handful that haven't won the title. So I, I still stand by my defense first choice. Yeah, I will say this, though, Scott, based on what you just told me, if we're going to finish with high 60s, which is probably top four in this era, and score 100 goals, or high 70s and not win the title and and, and concede 20, then are you okay with me taking the 100 goals for the more fun season that still results in a top four finish? I mean, if you can guarantee a top four finish and a fun season, yeah, that's probably true. Yeah, but, I mean, to I be fair, 67 is borderline. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think 77 is for sure getting yes, you into the top 100%, four. Yep. 67, you're fighting for it. Yeah, this season it would get you there, but not every season. Um, okay, so let me ask you this one. Would you rather add to this team peak Kevin De Bruyne and Virgil van Dyke? Well, they're in, they're in the peak. Or N'Golo Conte and Kylian Mbappe? Oof. Um, you mean, so... Are we talking about like them right now? Both of the all of the four players, or are we yeah. talking about? L- let's say right now. Yeah, why not? Um, I think I take N'Golo Conte and Mbappe. Um, just Mbappe, I think is probably just you could just see his future as probably you know the best player in the world. So I think I'd like to have the best player in the world on my team. Um, Conte is getting towards the the downside of his career, but I think he is still probably one of the the best defensive midfielders even if he's a little bit more injury prone so i think i take that so you'd take mbappe and, okay does anybody disagree with that by the way are we all taking mbappe the mbappe conte one anybody got disagreement there yeah i am yep you're, you're taking mbappe paul are you taking mbappe yep i think i'm taking mbappe clive Come on, you know my answer. Well, Mbappe. I just don't understand it. We already have a guy who's better than Mbappe in Martinelli. What do we need Mbappe for? I don't know. You guys have no faith in this team. It's it's pretty shocking, honestly. I, I think it's pretty shocking. You know, I, I think the great thing about these questions, though, right, is that they're not just about, like, answering what's best for the club, but they sort of reveal your preference for how the team would perform, you know, and, and things like that. And I think ultimately... You know, we, we all want the team to succeed, of course, but we may have different preferences for how we get there or how that's built. So, you know, I, I, I think some of the things that you get teased out here are what your priorities are beyond just the team being successful uh, short-term, intermediate-term, and long-term. I think I am on to Tim, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Coming out of this international break, would you rather see a continued progress defensively like what we feel we've seen. So we continue to progress defensively, but no improvement in our attack. Or an mm. improvement in our attack, but the defense backslides. I think I'd take the defense staying as it is. <clears throat> Pro- probably for similar reasons when I answered the uh, the Saliba question. It's, it's, it's just a doubt I have. 
Um, I think there's more to be done with the attack, and I think um, we will probably sell a Bamiyang in the summer anyway, and we'll probably be, be at a stage where we can integrate Martinelli more. We might make some kind of decision over Pepe, whether that's cutting our losses and selling on, or um, actually playing him in, in in more of a position that suits him, or giving him a bit more primacy in the front line. I I Again, I, I kind of trust us a bit more. Maybe this is just like a past experience thing, but I, I kind of trust us a bit more um, to sort that attack out. And to be honest, I, I think I've thought for a while the attack's unbalanced anyway, and it kind of needs knocking over and starting again. So even if, don't get me wrong, like I, I really want our attack to improve, but and, and I think that's kind of pivotal. But at the same time, I tend to think that's going to be fleeting anyway, because Aubameyang will probably go, and I think that should happen. Um, Ozil, you know... <sighs> I kind of hope that we can move him on. Um, I think that would be best for everybody at this point. And, you know, get Martinelli and Pepe a little bit more front and centre, perhaps figuratively and literally. I, like, like I'm I, I'm slightly less worried about the future of our attack because I think that future's coming. Whereas with the defence, like I say, we, we've invested in some kind of three-star hotels there. And I think they need a structure. They need, like, like again, if we had Virgil van Dijk at the back, I'd say, fuck it, go for the attack. Um, but we don't. We don't have that player. Um, so I, I think, you know, we need the structure there. We need that defence there. Um, and then next year, I think the attack's going to look quite different anyway. So I'd be happier if we looked more structured and organized and then rebuilt the attack in the summer anyway. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, it's tough, right? Because you th- you'd think, or at least I, my instinct is, that at any point Arteta could just decide to sort of emphasize the attack more. I mean, don't you get the sense that he's throttled it a little with the way we're playing? Yeah, yeah. Um, a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And, so if and, you- and I'm, I'm kind of fine with it. Yeah, exactly. So I'm saying, like, if he trusted his back line more, I get the sense that he could give it a little more gas up front, so to speak. Yeah, and also I, I think a lot of it is kind of just down to form as well. I don't think we've massively struggled to create chances. We've just got a couple of players up there who, uh, and we all know who they are, who aren't really in form. We've seen them in form before, and I think at least one of them will get some kind of um, end form back end product wise anyway. Um, so, like, I, I see the attack for the next few months as a, as a kind of temporary thing anyway, to be honest. And I think it will probably just get better just because a couple of those players might come into a bit more form. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm slightly less concerned about that. I, I just think we've got a lot of six, seven out of ten defenders. And uh, they they need that structure around them. And I, I'd be a lot happier just to see that base stay there. Um, and then we can, we can address the rest. Because, you know, we start, we've done stuff like we've not replaced Ramsey. Um, you know, we, we've got Ceballos in, but that's a completely different type of player. Um, and, you know, I, th- <clears throat> I think whether it's a Ramsey type, that attacking midfielder has to come in. Um, you know, if we lose a Bamiyang, which I think we will, and I think we should sell him anyway, um, then, you know, you've got to get a striker in. So I, I see that as, whereas with like the defenders we bought and Saliba coming, I don't see much more happening to that defence. So I'd be happier if they stayed solid because I think they're the ones we're going to be depending on next season. Mm, yeah, I think that's well said. And and Clive, I want you to know I've got a tricky one coming up for you. So prepare your brain, my friend. Um, yeah, all right. I'm with you. All right. So, Paul, uh, I think... You know, this is, I don't think you're going to like this one, but these are the ones that you usually sometimes find easy. So, you know, I just, maybe I haven't solved the mystery that is Paul. Um, Guardiola has been saying he could be sacked this season, which I think is Mm. funny. City are potentially facing a ban from Europe. Maybe he'll want to move on. He, uh, you know, he usually doesn't stick around for long. Let's say we finish sixth in the league and win no silver there, silverware this season. Would you rather stick with Arteta or hire Pep Guardiola? Uh, well, he'll stay at City. I think he's just he's just shadow boxing. Well, well, the let's old just, let's just say he's available. Would you sack yeah, Arteta yeah. after finishing six with no silverware to hire Pep, or would you stick with uh, Arteta? Uh, no, I wouldn't want... I, I don't think Pep's a fit for us at all. Um, 
maybe if he goes off into the wilderness 40 days, 40 nights, and does some soul searching and, and changes kind of his personality type. But man, he'd tear us a new one as a, as a manager, as a coach, which I'm sure lots of people are saying that's exactly what we need. But you don't actually want your, your club in pieces. I'm not saying he's he's done that at other clubs i just mean he um he, he's suited to a club i'm not even talking about budget i'm just talking about in terms of where they are in their their progression that has a level of talent we don't have um and a level of resources and resourcefulness that we're not there yet i'd like us to be i'd like us to be a good fit for for pep but we're just not. I, I I believe Arteta is a huge ceiling and is a really good fit for where we are at the moment. I hope he has the kind of ambition that every season he wants us to be significantly better than where we are. But, I mean, we'd uh, Guardiola do his bloody nut in at Arsenal in terms of where we're at and what we can provide him to go forward. I just don't think it's a good fit. And I... Uh, you know, just as I should not be married to Giselle Bunchen, um, because I couldn't live with that rock and roll lifestyle, I think we need to accept we should not be married to Pep Guardiola right now. So, yeah, and and to be fair, I also agree you should not be married to Giselle Bunchen. Uh, someone sounded like they wanted to jump in there. Did someone want to jump I just, in there? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say after Wenger, even Emery and Arteta, I, I can't have a bald manager. I'm afraid. Really, really? Yeah, I mean, yeah, can't, can't be done. Would After you say that? Would you say lines. that? Would you say that Pep's bald head is less desirable than the hair Emery had? <laughs> I mean, if you had to go out in public Probably looking not. like one of those two, which two would you want to look like? I've, that that's not a, a, a would you rather question <laughs> that we had lined up for the podcast originally. That's 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 a really good one. I I think I'd take the the graceful baldness, uh, yeah. not least because that's probably the direction I'm heading anyway. Yeah, I mean, God bless the hair suit members of this podcast, but we we love all <laughs> hairstyles and and hair amounts and volumes and whatnot uh, on this pod, except the Emery hairstyle. All right, Clive, here you go. Um, by the way, do you do you have a thought on whether you'd rather a bald or hair suit manager? Um, I like Arteta a lot. Okay, I, I, cool. I think he's top class. Okay, uh, so assuming we finish, you know, roughly, let's say a Europa League place in the league, and we don't win the Europa League, would you rather Arsenal win the FA Cup and Liverpool finish undefeated this season, invincible, or we win nothing, but Liverpool's only loss this season comes at the Emirates in April? I'll, I'll swing the Europa League anyway. No, no, no. We, so we we are in scenario one. The only thing we're winning is the FA Cup, and Liverpool are going invincible. Okay. In scenario two, we ain't yeah. winning shit, but Liverpool's only loss of the season is at the Emirates. Hmm. Hmm. I think. I think I would go with. Arsenal be in Liverpool at the Emirates and because I think it's a special thing that we've done but maybe it's not so special in the way football is changing but I like to think it's special going through the league undefeated but we can't deny Liverpool's team is fantastic and statistically the best team there's ever been but I still would think that day at the Emirates if we beat them would be as big as any FA Cup final, FA Cup final yeah, yeah. because that be it will just be it will just be one of those days where you basically sprint into the pub afterwards with, with your head exploding. It will be just brilliant. And um, and so sometimes we go to FA Cup final, you're away from your stadium. It's great. It's a great day. But you're in different places. And you'll disperse into different type pubs on the way back. But if you win a massive game at home, it's it's the best because you go to your normal places and everyone's everyone's at it and it's great. So uh, I take being Liverpool the Emirates just for the occasion. Yeah. A lot of Clive's answer seemed to come down to how much will he enjoy his drinks after a game. <laughs> yeah. It's very important. Right? <laughs> Don't before, deny that. Yeah. The game and the after. Your best days, I'm sure Tim will tell you this, right? Your best days, all three of them have to be they have to be in sync. You know, if you get a great pre-match and a great match and a great post-match, then it's a great day, right? 
It's mm. a great day. And, and, you know, the interesting thing is, look, we, we have won the FA Cup more than anybody else uh, in history. We've won it recently enough that we remember that joy. I don't think it pushes the club forward in any material way. I mean, we won the FA Cup, what, three out of four seasons when we were terrible. So I, I don't think it changes your, your status. Being the only invincible team means something, and denying it to Liverpool would be a modicum of joy in a, in a sea of smugness that is going to be washing over us towards the end of the season. So, yeah, I think I'd take that, actually. Um, but I can understand if you disagree. So, Scott... Would you rather win two of the next three Premier Leagues or one of the next three Champions Leagues? Um, I think I'd rather win two of the next three Premier Leagues. Really? Yeah, I don't know. I just feel that, yeah, I mean, the Champions League is the the best one. You know, it's the the most prestigious. But I don't know. I just feel like if you win two out of three Premier Leagues, you are going to be set up for, you know, just your team is going to be set up in a good spot. Um, you can build towards even more glory, I guess, from there. Uh, you know, the thing is, Scott, to your point, I didn't think about this this way, but like if you win two of the next three Premier Leagues over a span of, you know, let's say 369, 816, 24, so that'd be 114 games, you've been incredible. To win one of the next three Champions Leagues, you've been good over a few dozen games, right? So. You'd have more fun along the way winning the leagues than winning the Champions League because you'd be watching more good, dominant football. But I want the thing we've never done. Uh, so it's, I, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I don't, it's, it's, I mean, this is a hard question. I like, mean, don't, don't, don't you think don't that, give easy ones here. Guys, am I wrong that like winning the Champions League puts you in a different tier in world football just in terms of who you are and what you represent, as, as a famous man once said? Or is that incorrect? Tim, I mean, for you, the league probably means more. Clive mm. probably as well. But, but I mean, do, do you think that in terms no, of... No, no, no. No? You'd take the Champions League? Yeah, yeah, Colin yeah. Because yeah. we've never done it. Because we've yeah. never done it. I'd, I'd take the Champions League over three, maybe even four league titles in a row. Wow. I'd, okay. I'd, I'd, I in want a it, row? I want it done. Yeah. <laughs> wow, yeah. And so do you, it, does, it does materially change the stature of the club, doesn't it? Yep. And I think I can answer for Clive that he preferred to win the league with the drinking after all the games all through a season. Well, what I will say is, what I will say is, I was in Paris for the Champions League final for two days, and it was a fantastic drink actually those two days. But more importantly, the tension and the size of that game was just all encompassing. It was it was incredible. It was just incredible. One of the most incredible experiences of my whole life, and we didn't even win. Right, so to actually win one, I, I don't know what happened to me. I actually said at the time, if we won this, I may retire. I didn't mean it, but um, it could be you know, Arsenal, Barcelona. I just couldn't believe it. But if we'd have won it, I don't know if I, if anything could be better. Than well, that. we anyway. can't have that, Clive. The world needs your voice, or certainly the Arsenal world. And I will say it is ironic that the American who answered chose the leagues, and the supposed Brits on the pod chose the Champions League. Very, very interesting. I'm going to ask you two, Tim, uh, because I value your mm. contribution more than other people. Um, the first, Fair would right. you rather we had never done the Pepe transfer or the Tierney transfer? Um, Tierney, uh, for me, um, because I I haven't said this before. I'm still not sold, which is which is not to say that I won't ever be. I'm still like, you know, I'm still a bit curious. I don't think he's been that great when he's played, which again is not to say I don't think he ever will be, but um, I think there's work to do there. But but don't get me wrong. I, I tend to think he will probably come good, but I don't think I've really seen that yet. With all the, you know, the caveats about he was injured when he came and then he played a bit and then he got injured again and that's not ideal so isn't that part of the calculus though like the the injury track record itself (laughs) yeah yeah um but i i kind of think right the the thought i've been having as well is i i think it's going to take him a while because you know he's come from celtic he's come from scotland because of the geographical immediacy of it i don't think we think about it as much but the scottish league like what's that on par with in european terms now like greece maybe even like Cyprus or somewhere like that. If we bought a left back from Olympiakos, like a Greek left back from Olympiakos, I think a lot of people would be saying, okay, um, let's, let's see how this turns out. Um, so yeah, I, 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 
I'd still go with the Pepe transfer, I mm. think. Didn't expect we'd alienate our Scottish listeners on this episode, but there you have it. <laughs> um, okay, so the next one is, would you rather we never did the Mustafi transfer or the Shaka transfer? Uh, I'd rather not Mustafi because um, I think Xhaka has... I, I, well, they, they cost broadly the same. I think Xhaka's been better than Mustafi. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's kind of as simple as that. So I, I, I think Mustafi... Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, they they've both made like they they're both cut from similar cloth in that they're not bad players but they've made terrible mistakes but i think you know we're seeing at the moment Xhaka in like a system like this all of a sudden the mistakes aren't really there as much whereas mustafi you know i don't think it's a system thing with him do you know what i mean i don't think it's like with like with Xhaka, it's just it kind of is a mental limitation, but it's got, it's a physical limitation, really. Whereas I think Mustafi is a mental limitation, and I that I don't think there's much way of getting around that. So, um, and and I think, look, put it this way: we put them both up for sale in the summer. Who do you think is going to bring more money? Oh, I mean, it's obviously Shaka, but you know yeah. why I slightly disagree? Because with he's you? better. Yeah, well, yeah, there's no yeah. look. There's no question Shaq is better than Mustafi, but here's why I slightly disagree. We've had bad center, bad center backs before. Some would argue we've had only bad center backs before. Um, I think that, and I want to be clear, there's going to be people who are like, here comes Elliot's anti Shaq agenda, and you're right. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, look, I think the problem he has posed for structuring a working midfield has been a bigger issue issue for us that we've tried to finagle and work around whereas like Mustafi's just been bad you can have bad center backs we've had bad center backs we've tried to work around it he's cost us points I get it but I think this club has failed to solve the issue of the midfield in part because we have started Shaka every game and never really figured out how to make that work is that is that a reasonable point like the point that like yes he's the better player but he's caused us structurally bigger problems that we've just failed to resolve yeah, yeah, maybe. But I also think there's some stuff around that, like um, Cazorla uh, going and yeah, Ramsey surely. going. Um, like midfield's been, there's been a bit more turnover, whereas in defence, it's, yeah, it's just been like a bit of a, a bit of a bin fire, really. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm here for a bin fire every once in a while. Um, okay, so Paul, would you rather... We signed Francis Cochran back this summer, or you just got to spend one hour yelling at me about Francis Cochran? Um, well, you had me at Francis Cochran, and then you confused me again by offering me another Francis Cochran uh, <laughs> option there. Um, I always definitely liked him a bit more than 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 your average uh, Arsenal supporter. Um you know, we don't need him now with Torreira. So uh, I guess I'll take option B. Uh, I think Torreira gives me everything I would have wanted out of Cochrane and a lot more. Um, I think he was greatly maligned. I think he's actually been pretty good in Spain any time I've watched him. Um, so the guy plays a little bit of football, but he always had a ceiling. And without, uh, though, if we're getting Santi back, who wants to play one more game for us or perhaps another season or two, you know, coaching, but ends up in a starter every day, just in case. Um, I I could see us getting Coquelin in to renew that, uh, the Lone Ranger and Tonto again. Mm, I'll give you another one. That was obviously a silly one. Would you rather we finished top four last season or we sacked Emery in the summer? Ooh. Um. Uh. Um, like if we get top four, um, we're probably stuck with Emery for another what, two, season two, or two. two seasons. Yeah, maybe two. Yeah, yeah at least um, one. At least one. Yeah, but we we might all also find that we had a level of momentum, um, where we played a bit better. Eh. Uh, I think you got to pull the plug on Emery, and the earlier the better, in hindsight. Um, and we take our lumps. I mean, you wouldn't if I were running the club. You can't do that. But I think if you look at the really long game, then uh, getting a, 
if you're telling me we get Artet at the end of it either way, <clears throat> that's a little different. But I don't think that's the scenario. I think the other side of it is uh, plays out the way it plays out. We lose our, we lose Emery, but we get Arteta. And I think Arteta is the bet going forward, even if we're not top four, even if we're not in the Champions League at the moment. So whatever scenario involves losing Emery is the right scenario. Mm. I, we need I, to move on. I got to tell you, like, this is a harder question than I thought. Because to me, it's like, well, you, you just been been Emery. You have to. But like, think about it this way. If we stick with Emery and finish top four, you get a ton more money with CL. You invest more. But you're probably going to yo-yo right back out. We have a hard time seeing him giving us a top four finish this season. So you probably yo-yo back out. So what was it really worth? But, you know, if you, if you do finish top four and keep Emery, it also means you probably did at the expense of Spurs. So that's another, like, pretty positive thing for doing that. Having said that, if you've been him in the summer, you, you maybe do finish top four this season and you're on a, a better trajectory longer term. So, I don't know, I think it's tricky. I'm, I'm probably with you, though, uh, Paul. I'm, I'm going to do whatever gets him out of the club quicker and gets us moving forward. Clive, since we do uh, rewatch pods on the Patreon side of things quite frequently, would you rather rewatch the second half of the Watford game from this season, or the second half of the Newcastle game, 4-4 at Newcastle? Um, ah, um, what are you doing to me, man? <laughs> um, <laughs> it now. Um, that 4-4 Newcastle bothered me a lot. I didn't that like was the traumatic, referee. wasn't it, Clive? Didn't like the referee and didn't like the fact they were just allowing them to smash into us and we're the ones and getting people sent off. It felt like one of those Brits versus the foreigners day. I, I hated it. I hate that about how some games used to be refereed against Arsenal in those days. And uh, less so today, but it used to be really quite bad. So I can't take that game. I can't take it. The Watford game, that was just stupid players and stupid coaching all mixed together, whereas I felt the world was against us against Newcastle, and you felt momentum coming. So, uh, against Watford, although it was bad, it was like it was like an, almost a signal that things weren't quite right, and there was a lot of confusion around looking back in hindsight. So, um, so there could be something good there, if you know what I mean. So, um, so yeah, I don't want to go near that Newcastle one, mate. That's, that brings back memories of yesteryear that I don't like. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I go to Watford. Yeah, it's tough. I'll stick with you for another one, Clive, real quick. Would you rather Pepe plays every game the rest of this season or Nelson plays every game the rest of the season and Pepe plays none? So, in other words, whichever one you pick, the other one gets no starts. So what you're really saying is, what do you think? Is is, is Pepe your man? I, I I find Pepe an intriguing player. I think they're both intriguing players. Well, well first, I, answer the question. Then you can explain why. Yeah, well, Pe- <laughs> well, Pe- well Pepe, I, I go Pepe to play because I, I think he's he's got things we haven't seen yet. Whereas uh, with Nelson, I think, we, I think we know him better. And I actually think potentially we're not reading him right. Um, I seem to be the only one that thinks this. I think we're leaning into the wrong side of his game. I think we need to be leaning into a far more of a, well, than a, a, a final flourisher. I think we need to look at him as a, a build-up player, almost like a Mkhitaryan-type player, uh, someone slightly deeper that can work hard both ways and lean into his, his Britishness and his intensity in the press and, and his ability to receive on a half turn and carry and then pass to somebody else to do the, the, the actual finishing. That's what I think he's going to end up being, I think, and that's what I would lean into. So I think we're missing him. Whereas Pepe has got the ability to almost sit a, above the game and, and be the, the lead actor in the game, be the Tom Cruise. And I think... He has got Tom Cruise all written all about him. If we can get him into the right role, and I think that's really important. So, um, again, we, I think we're misreading him slightly, but I think that's coming, and he needs to do his bit physically and to secure the ball better. Um, but I, I don't see Nelson being a lead actor for Arsenal, whereas I think Pepe can be. Mm. I, I will say this. I think Tom Cruise is a bit too small to play in the Premier League, but, you know, we'll see. I hear you. 
Okay. You know what, guys? I thought that was fun, and I think that's a good a good place to leave it. Um, you know, at this point, I'm sort of making them up as I go along. <laughs> I don't know that that's producing any valuable content. So I think we'll leave it there. Clive's on Twitter at Clive PFC. Thanks, Clive. Thank you very much. Paul's on Twitter at Pause My Pants. Thanks, Pause. Woohoo! Scott's on Twitter at O underscore that underscore crap. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. And Tim's on Twitter at Stoberdo. Thanks, Tim. My pleasure as always. That was fun. Everybody have fun? I thought that was fun. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we'll do yeah, it again. yeah. Why not? Tim yeah. was a bit feisty, wasn't he? A bit <laughs> argumentative, I found. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 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 weird because that that's usually your job. Um, okay, well you know what? we'll definitely do it again if everybody liked it. If nobody liked it, um, it was Paul's suggestion. I don't know why we did it. In any event, my name's Alex. Uh, about, yeah, what? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was gonna say for Valentine's Day, it's been relatively innuendo free. Oh gosh, it's Valentine's Day. We have to do something for that. All right, Clive. Uh, would yeah, you, I'm missing it, by the way. Don't would, worry about it. Yeah, I'm no, just... no problem. Would you rather uh, a glass of wine with your mates on the podcast or a, a loving evening with your with your spouse, who I understand is decent? Yeah, she is decent, and <laughs> okay. she's in the other room. Okay, guess go, what go, see <laughs> go see her. Go see her. Scott, you, you still have plenty of time. You're on the West Coast. You can still make a, a Valentine's Day of it. Tim, I imagine you would like to get to your Valentine's evening with your loved one, uh, uh, with Deb. She, she, uh, she's actually at the theater tonight, so... <laughs> With are, are you in a th- are, choice. are you in a thruple or something? Is she with the other partner or something? Nothing like that. No, okay. no. Well, I've 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 come back from a women's game today, and she's gone to see a Harry Potter, um, is, the the Harry Potter play for like the fourth time. Is that so, co- um, is that code for people who are swingers? Like you you've been from the women's game, and she's with Harry Potter. We're, or? <laughs> we're we're both we've both been with the people we love. But um, in 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 any case, in Brazil. Um, valentine's day doesn't happen till june because this is carnival and Ah. the reason they don't have uh valentine's day in brazil in february is because carnival is when everyone fucking cheats on their partner Mm. so (laughs) so they don't do it and they put it they put it in june for that for honestly for that reason I have to run out and tell my wife something real quick. Um, <laughs> by the way, you're going to get information from Tim whether you want it or not, damn it. It's just always <laughs> nonstop stream of information. Paul, I, I presume you would like to spend uh, Valentine's Day afternoon slash evening with your with your wife. So uh, enjoy that. Have Valentine's Day to her. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I was actually making love to my wife during the podcast. <laughs> Well, I mean, we've been on for an hour, so what were you doing for the other 58 minutes? <laughs> oh, hey! You know. oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, I am going to go swim in a pool okay. with, with my wife uh, as we're visiting my family in Florida, and I am grateful for that. In any event, we love you. Swim uh, in a pool of your bodily fluids. And as I was saying, we're, we are going to end this pod, I promise you. Uh, we will have more great stuff. Hey, we did a, a pretty fun uh, mailbag episode for patrons this week. Look. We just want to uh, thank you for being here, whether it's on the regular pod, the Patreon pod, however you engage with this, we, we do really appreciate it. We hope you have a, a wonderful Valentine's Day wherever you are, that you welcome back the return of Arsenal, what will surely be a victory this weekend. So we'll talk to you after that. But until then, we love you, and we'll talk to you after Arsenal 10, Newcastle News.